All right, so I'm going to try to stand here at the podium for now, but I have a tendency to kind of linger and walk around, so I might end up picking up the microphone and walking a bit. Um, first and foremost, thanks for having me. What's crazy is that picture you guys saw up before that. I promise you that was only three years ago, and I now have this much more white in my beard. Um, but yeah, again, you know, hopefully you guys have had a great day, lots of kind of you know, engaging and, and you know, high value topics. And, and what I wanted to get into today is you know, some stuff that is hopefully gonna provide you some insights that you know, everybody I'm sure in here has heard of ransomware. Um, hopefully you guys have not had the experience of maybe going through a ransomware incident. And so I'm gonna give you some visibility into what that is like, but then also some of the things that we see and experience from the threat actor side. Um, you know, to, to the point previously, you know, one of the ways that we get this type of visibility is we're out there helping customers with, you know, responding to ransomware incidents, helping them with business email compromise. And so we do, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not quite sure, deal with ransomware and these types of threat actors on a daily basis. Um, so that's where we get a lot of this experience. So just to jump right into it, um, ransomware. Again, everybody's heard of it, but why is this so relevant to us? Um, First and foremost, because it can impact any organization of any size across any vertical. Um, so, I mean, it can be everybody from you guys are seeing things like what happened to MGM and other, you know, Fortune 50 companies all the way to, you know, mom and pop's gas station down the street. So it doesn't matter the size of your organization and how much you've invested in, you know, cybersecurity solutions and, you know, processes and technologies and everything else to, again, small organizations who can also be impacted by this. Um, with modern day ransomware, I'm guessing everybody is familiar with this, but you really only have three options. Um, either you're going to have access to backups that you can restore from, you either accept the loss of the data and that you're not gonna get it back, or you potentially pay the ransom. And we'll talk about that a bit later as well. But, um, you know, why are we seeing so much of this and why does it continue to grow? I'm gonna talk about a group called Conti. Um, they're a very, you know, they were a very prevalent threat group over the last couple years. Um, the reason we can talk about them very openly and show you a lot of detail about them though is because they have since disbanded. Um, what happened is Conti during the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict initially came out and they said, hey, you know, we fully support Russia. What they didn't think about is a lot of the operators who work internally for them were based out of the Ukraine. And so they started leaking their SOPs, their Bitcoin wallets, and all this other information. And so when we talk about these threat groups and the kind of money that they're making and the level of sophistication that they have, Conti's wallet got leaked. Within the year and a half that they were operational, does anybody want to take a guess on how much money they made? Anybody. Throw out a number. Two billion dollars. So with a B. So we're not talking about small amounts. We're talking about large amounts of money, bigger, you know, than a lot of market caps for certain types of clients and industries. So when we talk about like why are we seeing so many groups and so many people who are who are performing these types of activities? Because it's very lucrative for them. Again, they're making a ton of money. Now, when it comes to these incidents as well, um, you know, already mentioned that there's the kind of the whole double extortion piece and the triple extortion piece. Ransomware recently, where it used to historically be very opportunistic, it was almost like shotgun style approach. You send out emails to as many people as you can, and then you hope that you can encrypt their individual system and that they're gonna pay you to get access back to their system. And then they realized, well, you know who has more money than individuals? Organizations. So they start ta targeting organizations. And then the organizations, they get smarter to it. They're like, oh, we're, you know, we're gonna have you know, backups set aside. And they're like, so they start using more targeted attack techniques where they're actually hitting the backups and making sure backups are encrypted. All right, now we're gonna do offline backups. Oh, so now we're gonna add in that data theft and extortion piece. So now it's no longer just about the operational impacts. It's not about encrypting a bunch of systems. That's just one lever they're pulling to try to monetize their efforts. The other piece is now that encryption is really the last step of a ransomware incident. Prior to that, they're getting access to as much information as they can, what they believe to be sensitive information, stealing that from the environment, and even if you don't have to pay to get access to your backups, they're gonna try to get you to pay so that information isn't posted to one of their leak sites. And then now we've seen even a third method of extortion where they're saying, all right, you are able to recover from backups, you don't care what information we have and that we're going to leak, 
now we're going to DDoS you. So again, they're just continuing to evolve and try to make you know, themselves more sophisticated to try to monetize their efforts. So I think it's important to talk about just kind of ransomware trends as well. Um, in 2022, well, sorry, 2021, we saw more ransomware than we've ever seen. Um, 2022, we can speculate and hypothesize on what it was, but we did see a distinct kind of decrease in the amount of ransomware that was occurring. That could be due to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. It could be to, due to various other things. Um, but one of the key things here was just that during that period, it was still very active. It, it, by no means did ransomware go away. It had just slowed down. But as you can see, during that period, we're still seeing people posted to the leak sites and people who are impacted by this. Now, what's interesting is then you get into 2023. Within Q1 of 2023, we saw it resume back to 2021 levels of ransomware that we were seeing. Again, we can speculate, hypothesize on what that is. Maybe there's been a long enough duration since you know, that conflict started. Maybe some of these you know, businesses have run out of some of the cash flow and they're starting to, to operate again. But we saw where it's recovering to kind of 2021 rates. And then within Q2, we're actually seeing where it's even higher than that. We're now seeing even higher levels of ransomware and I didn't have an opportunity to get it in the slides here. But within Q3, we're at the highest volume of ransomware and public leaks, leaks that we've ever seen. Um, now, again, one key thing to consider here is that this information is based on clients who've actually been posted to leak sites. So we're seeing more and more groups because we track all these different threat groups and their leak sites and how many people have been you know, published in what in industry. And what's important here is that we're actually seeing an increase in the number of publications which could mean less people are paying ransom, but it could also be that there's more groups are actually operating and performing these types of activities. But within Q3, we actually are seeing the highest level of publications to ransomware sites than we've ever historically seen since we started collecting the data. Um, and that's with over 60 groups, 60 unique and individual ransom groups who are operating. So again, just talking very specifically about the first half and some of the things we've seen, is the overall increased volume. Again, higher levels than we've seen historically, but we're also seeing targeting of MSPs, uh, managed security or managed service providers, IT service providers. What they're doing is they're hitting them at that top level and then they're going down and they're impacting the individual businesses. And so say you've got an IT service provider who is providing services to 20 different companies, they're gonna target those 20 different companies that they work for and then potentially go back and target that IT service provider as well. So again, just becoming more effective with what they're doing. Um, Rebranding, we're seeing where they have, you know, taken their brand or their group and they've maybe disbanded, maybe they've just rebranded. I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail as well, but we'll talk about some of the specifics and trends that we're seeing with rebranding. Um, encrypting, encrypting ESX. Again, when you look at the motivations behind these types of threats, specifically cybercrime and ransomware, they're monetarily motivated. And so they want to ensure that they're being as effective as possible with their level of effort. So, you know, historically, you could go out and you could encrypt 50 different systems or hit the two virtualization servers and then all the systems under that are going to be encrypted. So now you can minimize your effort and they're encrypting and they're hitting at the virtualization level, which is gonna impact all the systems underneath it. Not to mention a lot of security solutions don't have the capabilities for detection and prevention at that virtualization level. So again, just more ways for them to be more effective. Um, the other thing is legitimate tools usage. Historically, we've seen where once a threat actor gets into an environment, they're going to set up you know, three methods maybe to ensure that if they got in one way and that way gets cut off, they've got two to three more ways to get back in the environment. What we're seeing recently is now they're setting up like five and six methods of persistence to get in the environment. And again, why use a bunch of malware and things that are going to generate signatures or alerts, instead use things that are native to the environment or legitimate tools that aren't going to trigger a bunch of things. Um, one that specifically comes to mind is a solution called uh, Atera and Splashtop. It's a legitimate IT management solution. And you can go to their website, you can put in your email address and use any email address. And with that email address, you get 
you know, 30 days access to this agent that gives you full remote access and management capabilities. So they're going to this website, they're getting the agents, they're pushing those out in client environments. It's a legitimate IT management solution. So it's not necessarily going to generate alerts saying, hey, we've started using this solution in the environment. Um, not to mention, if somebody is legitimately using it, we have to help them weed that out to determine is this a legitimate usage or is it not. Um, the other thing is coercive tactics where we're seeing Again, more of this kind of attempt to really push people to um, make those ransom payments based on information they're publishing, and I'll, I'll get into that in a bit more detail as well. But then I think we also need to talk about mass exploitation. Um, I think everybody has heard of what happened with CLOP and kind of, you know, where a bigger target has been impacted, and then because of that, all of the subsidiaries or information under that is being leveraged by them as well. So. Getting into how they get into the environment. Um, we get questions all the time from people who are like, I've got my son's iPad and it's connected to our home network. Could they weaponize a binary on that? You know, send it over to my work computer, which is still connected to VPN, upload it to a system. It's like, yeah, yeah, you could certainly do all that, but why get all Hollywood? There's no need for it. Instead, you could just, you know, fish somebody. Phishing is still extremely successful. Um, it allows them to get into the environments. The amount of people who set up rogue infrastructure or have open RDP to the internet maybe don't have, you know, MFA enabled on remote access. If you don't, please do that ASAP. Um, make sure you have MFA enabled. But then also look at the number of vulnerabilities out there. Based on the solutions, technologies, platforms, and everything else that we have, it's almost now like, oh, pick and choose your exploit. You're going to find one way or another in one system that potentially didn't get patched and be able to get into an environment. So we see a lot of exploitation of, of vulnerable systems now, which is really giving them access into an environment. Now, when we talk about all these different ransomware groups, there's so many different variations and groups and we have to try to track all of this information. Um, for instance, Black Cat Alpha, which was um, part of you know, involved with some of the MGM activity and Caesars that I'm sure everybody has heard of at this point. They were actually a rebrand of um, Black Matter, which was a rebrand of Darkside, which was responsible for the Colonial Pipeline. So things like the Colonial Pipeline, do we think that they really intended to have that large scale of an issue and problem? Probably not, because again, at the end of the day, these groups are built to monetize. So by shining a, shining a giant spotlight on them like I have in my face right now, um, <laughs> it actually just, it, it might put more focus on them for law enforcement where they can't operate and where they're not going to be able to make money. And so after Colonial Pipeline, what did we see happen with Darkseid? They went quiet. We didn't see anything occur from them for a couple months. And then they came back as uh, Black Matter. And so, Again, just one reason you might see these groups, well, it could be because of that. It could be because maybe this group has been placed on the OFAC sanctions list. If you're on an OFAC sanctions list, there's zero chance that you're going to get somebody who's US-based to pay that ransom for you. Because by doing that, that OFAC sanction list is you know, kept by the Department of the Treasury. You will receive you know, fines because you're essentially funding a terrorist organization. So I don't know a single U.S. Group, a base group that is going to pay that ransom for you, um, knowing that they're on that OFAC sanctions list. And so if you're a group and your whole intent is monetizing, then go ahead and change your brand, change some of your infrastructure, and then get off, and now you're a new group who's not on that list to make money for a while before hopefully that they would, they would find out and we would be able to prevent them from making pay payments again. So obviously you're not gonna be able to see this, um, but this is just to show you guys the level of kind of um, intertwining and tracking that we do of these threat groups based on their infrastructure, based on the um, code that they use. But this is really how, over time, you can see all of these different groups that we're tracking are intertwined. And so we have to try to manage this because having an understanding of this helps us when you go in to perform a, a response effort because you know their TTPs, um, you know what kind of tools that they use, you know how they potentially exfil data. If there is a necessity to potentially perform some sort of negotiation and, and, and eventually make a payment, you might have some history there 
on whether they're going to effectively give you your data back and you know, what type of information they're gonna supply you as part of those negotiation efforts. So all that is very useful. Um, the way that we track these though is we like to break them out into different groups. Um, you've got your, you know, your splinter groups who are a break off from one of your other groups. Um, you've got your full time groups who are like a lock bit who is just continuously present and, and performing a lot of activities over time. You've got your ephemeral groups who are those groups that are, they kind of pop up, make some money real quick, and then they go away and you never hear from them again. Um, and then you've got your rebrands, which are very distinctly like, hey, we used to be this group, and now we're specifically this group. So we try to categorize these, these different threat actors in their groups and, and put them in these categories, and they can shift and move between these categories accordingly um, as we're tracking them. So this is an interesting way to look at that data, though. When we talked about, hey, we're seeing a lot more rebrands, you can see that early in 2022, it was predominantly full-time groups. And as you see that, that kind of, the number of full-time groups decrease over time, you're seeing where there's more of these rebrands, splinters, and ephemerals who are popping up. So it's directly correlated where, you know, these groups, it's likely the same operators, but just splinters or, or different portions of them who are popping up. So again, another interesting way to look at it, just you know, based in a bar graph, I like bar graphs, and sometimes it's easier to see this way, um, that uh, you can see there that it was predominantly full-time in early 2022, and then changes over to these rebrand and ephemeral groups that are, are continuing to grow. So now that we've talked about the groups, uh, one of the more prominent models for ransomware is ransomware as a service. Um, it is, you know, by giving access to the platform, um, you're able for these, these groups are a little bit more sophisticated, like Lockbit, are able to make more money. And they've got very strict affiliate programs and models. So to become an affiliate of Lockbit, you have to submit your CV, you have to have, you know, history and, and records of two previous, you know, ransomware activities you've done. Um, you have to sign up and provide background about who you are as an individual. And they've got then very strict rules that they require you to adhere to as part of that affiliate program. Um, Lockbit specifically has this very well published on their website. You can go see what that affiliate program entails. And um, there was one instance where Lockbit very much says, hey, we do not target healthcare or hospitals. And so what happened is one of the affiliates impacted a hospital, took down services at a hospital, and so Lockbit came back and said, you know what, that breaks your affiliate agreement. They went and then publicly, re publicly released that affiliate's individual information and turned them into the police. So really kind of acting like the godfather, it's like, oh, you broke our rules, here you go, we're gonna turn you over. And really, with these affiliate programs and this ransomware as a service, I'll, sh I'll give you guys some insight into to what it entails, but like you have full access to the platform from everything from performing the communications to putting together the ransomware binaries, to you know, retrieving the exfil, to communicating with the victim, to then creating the decryption packages to, and receiving the ransom payments. And so giving somebody who's maybe less mature, less sophisticated, all that you have to do is sign up for that affiliate program and all that Lockbit wants is when somebody makes a ransom payment, they just want 50%. So they just want 50% of the ransom once somebody makes that payment. So, Starting with, you know, where would all of this start? This is a very specific example of a ransom note. And in most circumstances, this is how you're actually going to see ransomware initiated. You're gonna have these, these notes pop up on your desktop that say, hey, you've been encrypted. We've also stolen a bunch of information. Don't touch the, the files if you don't wanna, you know, ruin your ability to decrypt them. And go to this website so that we can start communicating and discussing, you know, what his, uh, you know, what your, what your terms are. I would not go to that website, by the way. <laughs> we'll talk about that in more detail, though, as well, but don't go to that website. But basically what they want you to do is download the Tor browser, which then gives you access to you know, deep and dark websites that you can't get to with traditional browser, and then that's where they have the, these leak sites that we monitor, um, and that's where we can communicate with them. So similarly, I talked about Conti previously. Again, you can see very similar format. One of the ways that we can identify which ransom group we're working against is through these ransom notes. Or maybe we have 
a group that we've never worked with before, we can go do comparisons of the notes of the information, pardon me, and of some of the infrastructure. And then we can go back and determine, oh yes, this appears to be a spit off or ephemeral group or, or a splinter group. But this again is like, hey, go to this website um, and, and we'll start and initiate the communications with you. Now when we talk about the leak sites themselves, this is what the, we're talking about. They like to call it a news site. Um, but what you can see here is you can actually see this is where they would post the name of the organization. And you can see, hey, here's details about the organization, information about what we've said that we've stolen from the environment. And then you can actually see how many people have viewed it, how much of the data has been released. So when you receive one of those ransom notes, if you do not make contact with them, this is what you can ex expect, is that eventually the name of your organization is going to be published to their leak site. And then eventually, if you continue not to make contact with them, then they're going to start leaking all the data that they stole from the environment. Similarly, that's one of the advantages of engaging threat actors, regardless of whether there's any intent to actually make a ransom payment, because you can delay these, these uh, distribution of information. And so, again, this is this though, whether it's you know because of not communicating with them, or whether it's through delays that have allowed you to engage external counsel, determine what your disclosure requirements are, what potential liability you have, and do your own release of information, and then you could still expect this after those communications. So on this new site, again, just to give you, you know, insight into the level of capabilities they have, they have contact forms. They've got things where they say, hey, media, you want to talk to us? We've got a public relations team. Go ahead and, and, and submit your questions here. We'll be happy to have discussions with you. This is their internal customer queue. So you can actually see here, oh, here are the different people that we've impacted. Here's the current status where we're waiting for them to, to respond or, we've respo or, or uh, we now need to respond. You can see the last time it was updated. Again, this is basically a case management queue. Within the case management queue, you then have the real-time chat functionality and capabilities where you can say, okay, here's the domain, um, here's the number of systems that were impacted, here's how much data we stole, and here's how you can communicate with them directly. This is better case management than I've seen with a lot of our clients. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, again, we're talking a fully-fledged platform that gives you access to do all of this within the platform itself and easily kind of track the victims that they've impacted. So, I mean, again, when we're talking about, you know, a level of sophistication with these teams, they've got, you know, QA and dev teams. We see where they're publishing job recs out on the dark web and they're collecting CVs and interviewing people. They've got financial analysis teams who, once you impact a victim, they're going in looking at the market cap of the company, they're evaluating the data that was stolen from the environment, and they're saying, hey, you know, your ransom amount should be $30 million. Sometimes they're way off. Um, but sometimes it's, it's pretty accurate. But they have teams of people, you know, develop, again, I mentioned Dev and QA, support teams. We've seen where somebody pays a ransom and the decryption tool didn't work effectively, so they troubleshoot that and they work through you to try to make sure that that happens because, again, these ransomware groups, as terrible as it is, they have a brand they have to uphold. And if people are making ransom payments and you're not getting access back to your data or they're still publishing all of this information, then they get a bad rep and it's going to be out there that like Lockbit or Conti, for example. Don't pay Conti, they're still going to release your information and you don't get your data back. So they were going to do, in most circumstances, everything within their power to make sure that you actually get access back to your data. Um, the chat functionality, and this is where we talked about kind of the importance of engaging these threat actors. Regardless of whether there's actually any intent on making a ransom payment, Leveraging expert negotiators and, and communicators who've worked with these groups because you can do things like, hey, I can get a file tree. Um, and that file tree, you know, as evidence, like, hey, tell us why you think we really owe you this amount of money. Oh, here's the file tree of everything we have. You turn that file tree over your forensics work stream and maybe where they had a bunch of encrypted systems and weren't able to see, oh, or is this where the source of the exfil came from? You can work with the client and you can say, oh, well, based on this file tree, we know where this information came from. It came from these servers, so we know realistically that's where some of this data was sourced. Um, you know, similarly, it can be used as a delay tactic. 
let's go ahead and disclose on our own terms with the assistance of legal counsel versus doing it on the, the threat actor's terms where they just publish it to their website. And so this is where you would do all those negotiations and communications with the threat actor, um, trying to either prolong based on whatever strategy you identify with the, with the client, the victim. Um, similarly, this is a different group, similar chat functionality, but fully fledged platform where they have access to do this. Less sophisticated was a Bienlian affiliate. Um, interestingly enough about Bienlian, uh, as well as some other groups we've seen, Bienlian, somebody was able to get a hold of their um, encryption binaries and able to create a decryptor. It hasn't slowed them down one bit. They're still out there and they're not encrypting customers' environments anymore. They're just solely focusing on that data theft and extortion, and they're still making a ton of money. And they're not even doing the encryption piece anymore, which is a, is a trend we've seen. Now, we've seen recently or heard that they are updating their malware capabilities and going to be releasing a new form that can do encryption again, but right now, they're focusing solely on extortion. But in this instance, this was one of their affiliates, less sophisticated, that was you know, using encrypted chat via Signal. I mentioned briefly uh, earlier about kind of coercive tactics. And this is one of the things that's a little bit more, I don't want to say scary or just kind of concerning for me, is where they're leveraging specific information sometimes about individuals or about organizations to really try to drive the necessity for that ransom payment. In this instance, this was information released by Alpha, which is Black Hat, again, the group that was responsible for MGM. Um, they were participating in the Zoom session for the responders who were actually responding to the incident. And they were taking pictures of themselves in that chat, releasing that out publicly, and saying, look at these fools, they're trying to resolve this incident and think we don't know what's going on. And then they're putting snippets of their email in there, their internal communications, and they're publishing that out saying, hey, look how you know, dim-witted these people are you know, they need to be paying us instead. So they're using these more coercive tactics where it's like really kind of harming the brand of the, of the, of the victim organization. Um, this was another one with Avos Locker where Bluefield University was, was hit by ransomware. They specifically went in, they went into the emergency uh, notification system that would be used for like, hey, we're having a hurricane and classes are canceled for the next two days. They went into that system and they sent out a message to the entire student body that said, your university has been encrypted by ransomware. We have access to all of your student records. You guys should go talk to your, to your facilities and, and, and convince them to make a ransom payment. So again, they're using these coercive tactics like this emergency system to go in and send things to the entire staff. We saw one uh, incident where once they got in, they used the client's SCCM server. So they're, what they use for patch and package management they use that to distribute their, uh, their ransomware and encrypt all the systems. So it's like use what's native, use what's available, and use it to your, again, as an opportunity to try to monetize your efforts. So now when we talk about, again, just the capabilities, decryption process. This is all built within that same platform. Now you've made the ransom payment. You've negotiated it. They've received their ransom. You can see for them, it's in some circumstances, it's as easy as, hey, I've got this type of system, I need these type of decryption binaries. You click on those links, it spits out a, uh, you know, a decryption tool, you send that over to the client, and then next thing you know, they're able to decrypt their systems. So again, fully fledged, fully capable, you know, all within this platform, try, kind of really simplifying what you know, the people who are able to use it can do. So just tying into a very specific example, um, this one was Alpha. We like to use Alpha as well recently because, you know, again, I think everybody's kind of fully aware of what happened with MGM and, and Caesars, and so they're a group we've been tracking for a long time, and we like to use them as examples. But in this instance, you know, they did have a bunch of encrypted systems. They encrypted at that virtualization level, again, so to, to you know, make sure they were being as effective as possible. They exfiltrated over 1.4 terabytes of data. And this one, it included you know, proprietary information, sensitive information, HR documentation. Um, when we talk about when they go in and they search for information, we see where they're running queries that'll say you know, sensitive, proprietary, insurance. We've had instances where you know, the threat actors said, hey, $5 million ransom. We work with the client based on the strategy. They say, we want to start with $250,000. 
So we go in there and say, okay, that's fine. Um, and so we propose, hey, we've got a maximum of $250,000. And they go, yeah, that's not true. Here's your insurance information. It says you've got coverage up for $5 million. And so they actually paste that into the chat. And that's when you go back to the client. You're like, hey, they've got access to this. Um, what's, well, you know, and we'll work with them on the strategic kind of next steps. But when we talk about the types of sensitive information, um, even though this is an oil and gas company, we're talking not only about customer records, it's internal employee records. Um, in this instance, they had information on like uh, accidental deaths within the workplace. And again, they were trying to use that as things that they could be coercive about to try to get that ransom payment. Um, in this instance, they did actually make the ransom payment. It got them removed from the leak site because this customer didn't know what to expect. So they initially got posted to the leak site. That's when they engaged us. We were able to negotiate like, hey, we removal from the leak sites. Um, we want proof of deletion of all the files. And you know, there's not gonna be a DDoS as well. In this instance, they actually gave us what they considered a security audit report as well. Um, <laughs> They, they tell you that this is a pen test. They will like, they'll say, oh, we did this as a pen test and you know, we're providing you a service. And no kidding, in, in some of these instances, you'll get a multi-page report where it's like very specific, where it's like we got in initially via this system, we we're able to elevate privileges to this account, use this account to move laterally to these systems, stole data from these systems, put back doors here, and they'll have that level of detail. But then they give you strategic recommendations they're like, you need to have EDR, you need to have PAM, you need to have an MDR who's actually monitoring all this stuff for you. And so they consider it a security audit report. Um, but in this instance, uh, the client was down completely, and this is an oil and gas company, for three days. So as you guys can imagine, that's a huge impact to their customers. But then they were, had limited operations where it was strictly email and providing some services for 21 days. I hate to say it, that's actually pretty quick. Um, clients don't sometimes seem to understand that like when you have down systems that are encrypted, operationally crippled, um, this stuff takes a lot of time to recover. So in this instance, again, initial access was uh, via you know, the VPN. They did not have MFA in place. I can't reiterate enough. If you guys have VPN set up with no MFA, please do that ASAP. I know a lot of senior, leader, uh, senior leadership and everybody else will say that you know, it's a giant pain, but that can be enough of a hurdle that some of these less sophisticated actors will just go on to the next one. Um, but post exploitation framework, use Cobalt Strike. If you see Cobalt Strike in environment, generally you got either pen testers in there doing some work or you got a threat actor, one of the two. Generally, you're not gonna see Cobalt Strike outside of those two instances. Um, this was the instance where they used the SECM server to actually deploy using the client's own internal patch and package management system. And then they use, I mean, there's different threat actors use different methods to get the information and, and kind of data out of the environment that they want to exfil. Um, in this instance, it was, you know, PowerShell. We've seen where they literally will set up network shares and they will, the clients will allow outbound, you know, uh, network services and they'll file share it out. Other instances they're using, you know, uh, SFTP, all sorts of different methods. So all that being said, it's not just doom and gloom. Uh, you can get some sleep at night because there are ways to thwart, thwart this. I mean, again, I think everybody here probably understands it's about early identification of threats. The sooner you can identify them in your environment, whether it's that initial successful phishing email you're gonna be way better off than whether when you start identifying or finding those ransom notes on your systems. Or if you start seeing outbound exfiltration and large, you know, large amounts of data going out of the environment. But the key here is, is focus on the fundamentals. We tell that, client to, tell that to clients all the time. Things like having EDR, MFA, just focus on the fundamentals. And a lot of times, that's going to be enough for some of your less sophisticated or less targeted threat actors where they're just gonna move on to the next person who doesn't have some of those basics set up. The other thing is work with people. And I don't just mean service providers like ourselves, work with your peers, work with your competitors. We have had instances where we're working with clients in an industry and we'll set up a threat intel uh, you know, working groups with their direct competitors. We're not saying share trade secrets, we're saying you guys are all battling the same thing. So use your peers because realistically, somebody or multiple people in this room have undergone and, and dealt with something like this. Um, have knowledge of your assets and applications. I can tell you one of the biggest things we do is we go into client environments and we say, hey, 
where's all your critical data? And they go, uh, or we say, sorry, what is your most sensitive and critical data? What are your crown jewels? And they say, this is what we do, and this is what's more important to, most important to us. Okay, where's that located? We can't answer that question. It's probably distributed in all these 17 different places, and it's like, okay, well, just having that understanding to understand the true risk and evaluate that risk quickly associated with an incident is, is helpful. Um, what's my last one there? Oh, having a plan. Make sure you have a plan, execute against that plan. I'll talk about that in a, a bit more detail. The other thing is, is we very frequently get clients who've been impacted by ransomware. They say, hey, we cleaned up the systems that, had, that were encrypted. We think we're good to go. Absolutely not. With modern day ransomware like we talked about, those are just the systems that were encrypted. Realistically, they stole data from the environment, and that's just a small piece to the larger puzzle. Um, and then we're seeing these instances where they're living off the land. Leverage tools and, and things that are native to the environment. Um, and one thing that is key, is you have to identify root cause. You have to find out how they got in. Because while they might not hit you over and over again from the same group, they definitely will sell access to a different group, again, monetizing their efforts, and then have another group hit you. And that's what they'll do, because we, I mean, we get asked the question all the time, can I be expected to be hit by LockBit again and again and again? No, because then people stop paying LockBit. But they'll leave a back door in there, and they'll sell it to the next person who can hit you. So, and then obviously, as you guys can understand, incidents are high impact. Um, when we do talk about focusing on the basics, make sure that it's not just technology, though, as well. There are very kind of standard things, and I think cyber insurance is helping drive these conversations and these kind of core requirements. But yes, put in MFA, EDR, PAM, a SIM, backup solutions, but make sure you have an incident response plan, playbooks that are specific to ransomware and other types of threats, perform table -like top exercises, and bigger and most important than anything, user awareness training. I'm sure everybody here does phishing training and, and, and how to get people not to click on links, but what's just as important for that is getting people to understand the true impact if they did do that. Like, don't just tell them, hey, here's how to identify a link and, you know, bad stuff can happen. Let them know that that single click can result in millions and millions of dollars worth of loss. The other thing is just knowing roles and responsibilities. There's a lot of different people involved in these response efforts. So you've got your incident response service providers who might be your recovery and restoration team. They might be the ones doing your brokerage and negotiations. Um, you've got your cyber insurance, external counsel. Again, lots of different people here. So practicing and doing these types of things proactively is what's going to help you. I can tell you the difference between clients who have incident response plans and practice those via tabletops, it's much different than going in there and working with clients who don't. So when you guys have an opportunity, draft up a scenario and test that scenario and make sure people know their roles and responsibilities. And that's it. So happy to answer any questions you guys have, but hopefully that was uh, some insightful information for all of you.